In this video, we will learn how to analyze truss structures, which are a specialized case of frames. The learning objectives of this video is to define the requirements and assumptions needed for simple truss analysis. We will learn how to determine if a structure can be analyzed with simple truss analysis, and we will begin to analyze trusses with the method of joints. You will also learn how to determine which members in trusses are zero force members, and we will learn the convenient notation for analyze truss free body diagrams. Trusses are very common structures that people have been using for thousands of years. Trusses leverage the incredible stability and strength of a triangular structure and its ability to support high loads. The advantages of trusses is that you can support very high loads over long distances with minimal material, creating a strong and lightweight construction. Here we have a picture of a truss structure for the roof of the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Another example that you might may have seen driving to school every day on the 92 are the large cranes along the side of the highway. These can be modeled as truck structures. Bridges are another common structure that trusses are used for, as well as airplanes, and here a 3D truss structure shown at the SFO International Airport. Note how all of these structures are made out of triangles. The requirements for simple truss analysis are that the structure is composed of entirely two force members. This assumption carries with it several other assumptions that follow and that are necessary for truss analysis. In order for us to model a structure as a truss, the members must be modeled as being connected with frictionless pins at the joints. The mass of the members must also be negligible compared to the applied load. This is reasonable for most trusses such as bridges, aircrafts, or even cranes. The truss members can only be loaded at the joints and cannot have any applied moments on the structure. These are all requirements for a two-force member. Please see the video on two-force members if you're rusty on them and want a quick review of two-force members. Seen in this picture is a truss structure bridge. In order to model this with our simple truss analysis, what we have to do is assume that the plate connections can be modeled as pin connect. To do this, at every joint, we would model it as a frictionless pin. Although this is not the true physical case, it can provide a reasonable estimate of the forces experienced in the structure, as well as a good understanding of whether members are in tension or compression. In modeling this as a simple truss, I have replaced all of the joints which are in reality welded joints with pin joints. Now I can begin to analyze this as a simple truss analysis. I'll also assume the connection to the pier is represented by a pinned connection. Therefore, we'll have a, a RY and an RX and no applied moment. Since the road bed is not actually connected to the truss and connected to the cross members, it will only be loaded at the nodes or joints. Our requirement that trusses are loaded only at the joints is a good assumption when we look at trusses in practical application. For example, if a truss is used to support a roof, typically the roof is connected to cross members and the cross members are transmitting the force to the node connected at that joint. Similarly, a bridge structure would distribute the load across several cross members which are connected at the joints. This can be modeled as a distributed force along the bridge at each joint. In order for a truss structure to be statically determinate, which means that we can solve for the reaction forces, it must be a simply supported truss. For simply supported trusses, the truss is connected to the ground by a pin connection and a roller connection. This is statically determinate because this connection system is represented by three unknowns. When a structure is supported by a pin and a roller, it is called a simply supported structure, or in this case, simply supported truss. Let's look at a truss structure made by one triangle. In order for this to be a truss structure, each member must be individually connected by pins at the joints. We have a joint or pin connection at A, B, and C. Taking the structure apart, we can see that we have three members, members A, C, B, C, and A, B. These three members are individual from each other and connected by pins A, B, and C. The pin goes through a hole at these locations of the members, connecting it. Assuming members AC, AB, and BC are two force members, 
let's draw the internal forces on the members from the pins. Focusing on the member, if we assume the members are in tension, that means there must be outward forces along the line of action of the member pulling the member apart. As a convention for two force members, we will call this FAC, since it is the internal force on member AC. In order to be consistent, there must be an equal and opposite force in pin C and an equal and opposite force on pin A. Following the similar process that we just used for member AC, we can represent the forces on the pins B and C from members AB and BC in a similar manner. Note I have chosen that to put all of the members in this structure in tension. Next, I can draw the reactions on pin A and pin B since this is where they are supported, in this case by a, by a simple support, which is a pin connection at A and a roller connection at B. Focusing in on the pins, we can see when the members are in tension, the pins are being pulled outwards. When doing truss analysis, the convention is to put members in tension, and when we solve and find that a member is actually in compression, we know that the force must be going in at a joint. This can be seen by redrawing the forces on the structure to put the members A, B, A, C, and B, C in compression. Now I have drawn forces that are compressing each member we see the forces at the joints is going in or pushing in on the joints. When a member is in tension, we say that there is a positive force in the member. When a member is in compression, when a member is in compression, the convention is to say that there is a negative force in that member. The goal in truss analysis is to find the forces acting on the truss as well as to find the forces in the individual members of the truss given an applied load. Let's look at our equilateral triangle truss structure to understand how this can be done. Here we have an applied load P which is known at C and we want to see how this affects the reaction forces on the truss as well as the forces in the individual members of the truss. The first step in any truss analysis is to analyze the truss as a whole given an applied load. To accomplish this, we will choose the whole truss members excluding the pin and roller support as our system. In my free body diagram of the entire truss structure, I have replaced the pin support at A with the reactions at A in the X and Y direction and the roller support at B with a normal force to the contact of the surface that the structure is lying on. Now I must use equilibrium analysis to find the reaction forces at A and B given some applied load P at C. To do this I can start by taking a moment at A to solve for the reactions at B. Taking the sum of the moments at A I have the length L which is the length of the member times RB minus the vertical direction from A which is L sine of 60 times P, and this is equal to zero. Taking the sum of the forces in the Y direction, we have only the RAY and the RB forces. Therefore, RAY is equal to minus RB or minus P sine 60. Taking the sum of the forces in the X direction, I find that RAX is equal to minus P. The next step in this analysis is to take a free body diagram of the individual members. Taking this structure apart, the forces in member AC, BC, and AB are unknown. By convention, we choose to put them in tension, although this may not be the case. Another thing to note here is that the reaction forces are being applied only to the pin and not the members AC, BC, and AB. The method that we are going to use here to analyze the forces in the truss will focus in on the pins and we will ignore the members. This is called the method of joints because we will be analyzing the force in the joints of the truss. Focusing on the free body diagrams of just the joints is called the method of joints. Note since we have decided to put each member in tension as the convention, 
all the forces from the members must be going out from the joints. This is kind of confusing because it looks like they could be putting the members in compression. However, a force going out on the joint represents a force pulling out of the member or pulling the member in tension. After drawing the free body diagram of the joints, we must select which joint we want to start our analysis with. Since these joints can be modeled as points, we have an equilibrium of points or particle analysis. Since all the forces are at the particle, there can be no moment from the forces about the particle. Therefore, we can only solve for two unknowns at a joint. In this case, since there are only two forces that are unknown at each joint, it would be okay to start at A, C, or B. Let's start by analyzing the joint at A. Starting with joint A, we will use the sum of the forces in the X direction and the sum of the forces in the Y direction to solve for the forces in AC and AB. We will not use a moment equation here because there is no moment about a point. Start with the sum of the forces in the Y direction for joint A since there is only one unknown in the Y direction, that is the Y component of FAC. We find that FAC is equal to negative RAY over sine of 60. Recalling that RAY was equal to minus P sine 60, we find that FAC is equal to positive P. Taking the sum of the forces at joint A in the X direction, we have RAX plus FAC cosine of 60 plus FAB is equal to zero. Solving for FAB, we find that it's equal to minus RA minus FAC over two. Recalling that RAX is equal to minus P and FAC is equal to plus P, we have that FAB is equal to P over two. Now that we have solved for all the unknowns in joint A, we will move along to joint B. Moving on to joint B, we have already solved for the force in member A, or FAB. The last unknown to solve for is the force in member BC, or FBC. We can do this by taking the sum of the forces in the y direction. Taking the sum of the forces in system B and setting them equal to zero, we find that FBC is equal to minus P. Now we have solved for all of the forces in our members. Since FAB is already known, we can check to ensure that we have done a correct analysis by solving for FAB as if we didn't already know it. To do this, we can take the sum of the forces in system B in the x direction. We find that FAB is equal to minus FBC cosine of 60. Plugging in for FBC, we find that FAB is equal to P cosine of 60, which is the same as what we had previously solved for. Putting our solution together, we have that RA is equal to negative P in the x hat direction, minus P sine theta in the y direction, and RB is P sine theta in the y direction. We've also solved for the forces in member AC, AB, and BC. We found that the force in member AC is P, and that is in tension. We know that the force in member BC now is minus P, and that is in compression and that the force in AB is equal to P over two, and this member is in tension. This is the generic method for solving the forces in the members of a truss system utilizing the method of joints. Let's look at a quick summary of what we have done in this analysis of a truss using the method of joints. The first step in this process was to do a free body diagram of the truss as a whole system we were able to solve for three unknowns for the reactions. Next, we took our system apart and analyzed the joints at A, B. We could have also analyzed the joints at C. In each of these systems, we had two unknowns and two equations available for us to solve the unknowns. We chose to start with joint A and move to joint B, but could we have used the free body diagrams in another order? And the answer is yes. Let's count the amount of joints that we had in this system. In this system, we had three joints and three members. Here are some guidelines for using the method of joints. 
when choosing the order of joints for analysis, you want to choose a joint that has at least one known force and also has at most two unknowns since you only have two equations for a point analysis. The next step is to work from joint to joint to solve all of the unknowns in your free body diagram. Under what circumstances does the method of joints work? It turns out that for a truss structure, the number of members relative to the number of joints must be equal to m times 2j minus 3. If this relationship is held upheld by a structure, it is said to be internally stable without redundancy. If there are more members than 2 times the joint minus 3, then the member is then the truss is said to be internally stable with redundancy. And if the number of members is less than 2j minus 3, the member the truss structure is said to be unstable. In this class, we will only focus on internally stable trusses without redundancy. Anytime we have two members coming together at a joint with no applied force at that joint, these two members are said to be zero force members. This can be seen by drawing a free body diagram of joint A. Here's my free body diagram of joint A. I have chosen to use the convention that the members are in tension. Therefore, I have drawn the forces out at joint A. Taking the sum of the forces at joint A in the y direction, I have 0 is equal to FAC. Therefore, FAC is equal to 0. Then taking the sum of the forces in the x direction, I have FAB I have FAB plus FAC cosine of theta is equal to zero. However, since FAC was is equal to zero, we find that FAB is also equal to zero. Therefore, members AB and AC are said to be zero force members. This is the case when we have only two members coming to a joint that is not loaded. These members are not pointless, however, since another scenario we may choose to put a load at A. Another scenario where we have zero force members is the scenario when we have two members, in this case member AB and AC aligned, and a third member connecting to that joint that is not aligned with member AB and AC, and no applied load at pin B. In this scenario, member BD is a zero force member. This can be seen by drawing a free body diagram of joint B. Drawing my free body diagram of joint B, I have chosen to go with the convention of each member being in tension. Therefore, the forces are going out at B. I have the force from member AB along member AB and the force from member BC along member BC, as well as the force from member BD along member BD at some angle theta from BC. Taking the sum of the forces in the y direction again, we have that this is equal to FBD sine of theta. Therefore, FBD is equal to zero. Taking the sum of the forces in the x direction at joint B, we find that FAB is equal to FBC. Whenever we have three members coming together where two members have the same line of action, if there is no applied load at that joint, this will be a zero force member. If there is no applied load at, joint, at the joint, the member that is not along the line of action of the other two members is said to be a zero force member. However, if we were to apply a load at B, this would no longer be the case. However, if we were to apply a load at P, this would no longer be the case since the sum of the forces in the, X, in the Y direction 
at joint B would be equal to minus P be equal to minus P plus F B D sine theta. Therefore, F B D is equal to P over sine theta. Therefore, when member, therefore when joint B is being loaded in a direction not along the line of action of the two members who share a line of action, member B D is no longer a two zero force member. Let's take a look at this truss structure and try to find any zero force members. I'll give you a moment to try to identify any zero force members in this structure. You probably immediately see the member EC is a zero force member since member DE and EF are in line and there is no applied force at joint E. Therefore member EC must be a zero force member. And you may also see that member GB is also a zero force member by the same logic. Not immediately obvious is that member CF is also a zero force member since EC is a zero force member and DC and BC are in line. This means that member CF is also a zero force member. However, member FB is not a zero force member since there is a applied load at B that is not along the line of action of CB or BA member FB is not a zero force member. So the zero force members are EC, CF, and GB. We have learned that the requirements for a simple truss is that the truss is constructed entirely of two force members loaded only at the joints. We have also learned how to analyze a simple truss with the method of joints. We know that if the members is equal to 2 times the number of joints minus 3, then this structure is statically determinate and we can find all the forces in the members using simple truss analysis. We have also learned how to determine whether a force in a truss is a zero force member or not, as well as conventions for simple free body diagrams in truss analysis.